We're going to start off with the basal ganglia. Um, here it is. That will make complete Super sense simple. whenever we're done here. And what that is going to allow us to do is select appropriate actions. Filter out the noise. Um, your, your brains are not silent. Uh, only when you're dead are they silent. And that's probably after um, extreme epileptiform activity due to global depolarization. And then after that, they're silent. But as long as you're alive, they're not. Uh, your neurons are always firing. They're making guesses as to what's going to happen. What should you do if that happens? What if it doesn't happen? What should I do then? There's a lot of junk going on. There's a lot of inappropriate actions that we all filter out. Just involuntary movements of the head and the limbs, those all get passed through the basal ganglia before our motor cortex actually approves them and carries them out. And all the junk is filtered out. That's the job of the basal ganglia, in part. Filter out the junk. Don't carry out those inappropriate actions that won't actually help you, that you shouldn't do, that aren't uh, in line with your goals. And whenever you choose to do something, do it quickly. I think those are the two functions of the basal ganglia. The first half of this, we're just going to talk about the players. Striatum, subthalamic nucleus. Here's our two inputs. Then we have a middleman, or woman, uh, the GPE, the external globus pallidus. You'll see why it's external when we see a coronal slice. This is a mouse brain, by the way. This is where I'm most familiar with the basal ganglia, but we have them too. Then we have our output nuclei. The GPI, or the internal globus pallidus, they're both pale globes, hence the name, and the substantia nigra, pars reticulata, very close to the SNC, also an important player. We'll hit all the nuclei and then we'll string them together like this to go through our three pathways. We'll say there's three, usually we only say there's two. There's probably a lot more than that actually because there's feedback everywhere along the way. We're gonna talk about this as if it's a linear path, but there's feedback. The GPE feeds back to the striatum, for example. So it's a little more complicated than what we'll go through today, but we'll keep it simple. This way at the end you'll understand how the basal ganglia work. And for the most part, as you can see up here, it's a lot of inhibition. Notice those blunt arrows, a lot of GABA here. There's really only one glutamatergic player besides the cortex, and that's our STN, subthalamic nucleus. Everything else is GABAergic, except for the dopamine and cholinergic neurons. But everything else, all the GABAergic ones are GABAergic. The basal nuclei or the basal ganglia are just a collection of, of cell bodies under the cortex that help us select appropriate actions. They're going to get input from the cortex about what we're doing, what we think we should do, also how we're feeling. But we'll talk about that in the limbic system lecture. And that's going to help us determine what should I do. Should you get up and leave? Probably not. You might want to, a little part of you, but another part of you wants to stay because I'm so, just so damn charming. <laughs> and you got to know this stuff. You want to do well. So it's in your best interest to sit there and pay attention and take notes. And you should thank your basal ganglia for helping you reach that decision. It's all about action selection. That's what they're doing. They help determine which of those motor programs that we're passing through should I carry out. Should I carry out the get up and leave motor programs? No. I should carry out the sit, pay attention, and take notes motor programs. The place where we're going to start is the striatum. This has a few different names. You can divide it into your caudate over here in the ventricles, or your, in your putamen there. But we'll just put them together and say striatum. It's called that because it has striations in it, little stripes. Stripes of axons running through it. That's how it got its name. There are some functional distinctions here. Where we're going to be hanging out today is the dorsal striatum. 
your caudate entertainment. Down here, this nucleus incumbens, this is what we'll talk about in lecture 22, when we talk about the limbic system. Because the input there, as we'll see in just a moment, comes largely from emotional circuits. Not so much from the motor areas. So we can divide our striatum a little more meaningfully into the dorsal and ventral components. So here it is in a coronal slice. Here's our overlying cortex. These are going to project downward into the striatum. So here's our first major input nucleus, the striatum. There are a few different cell types in the striatum. The major one to know would be the spiny projection neurons because these account for about 90, maybe 95 percent of all the neurons in the striatum. As their name suggests, they have spines in their dendrites and they project, meaning they send their axon elsewhere. These other two populations are going to be local neurons. They're going to keep their axons within the striatum and affect the activity of the output neurons. The spiny projection neurons do not pacemake. This makes them unique compared to all the others we're going to talk about. They don't fire action potentials until they get glutamatergic input from the cortex. The rate at which they fire action potentials is going to be determined by local GABAergic neurons. These don't have spines. Notice this cartoon doesn't have spines. Here's our, they call it medium spiny neurons back in the day. Some folks still do, but now we prefer a spiny projection neuron. So that's what we call those. We also have large A spiny neurons. These are the cholinergic inner neurons. These are going to provide acetylcholine onto spiny projection neurons and determine whether they are more or less excitable depending on which type of muscarinic acetylcholine receptor they express. So not nicotinic in this case. We're going to have some that have M4 and some that have M1, so GI, GQ. More on that later. So the principal neuron to note here is the spiny projection neuron. It's going to send GABAergic projections to other areas of the basal ganglia. The input right here, the glutamatergic input, is going to come from the cortex. Now where in the cortex depends on where you are in the striatum. The dorsal striatum up here, this is largely going to get input from your sensory motor cortices. There will be some input from the thalamus as well. Also from the frontal cortex, so planned actions. That's going to hit more of your intermediate striatum or the caudate, a little more lateral in the dorsal striatum or in that uh, patamen. This is where we're going to have more of our actual body maps, motor output that's being tested through. The ventral portion is going to have input from limbic structures. So down there in the nucleus accumbens, this is going to determine more um, how we feel about stuff. Reward, addiction, things like that. Those are going to involve the nucleus accumbens because this input is going to come more from limbic structures as opposed to motor cortices. That's why we're going to stick in the dorsal striatum today. The basal ganglia are there, about, uh, are there to select actions. They affect motor output. The nucleus accumbens will do this, but it's slightly different. So we'll come back to that later. But you can see here there's a little bit of a body map. The head area is connected to the forelimb area, is connected to the trunk, connected to the hind limb. There's an orderly arrangement. We see this in the cortex, we see it in the spinal cord, we also see it in the basal ganglia. So you have it in the striatum, you're going to have it in other areas as well. The other input nucleus from the cortex is the subthalamic nucleus, just below the thalamus. So we've just taken a, a step back with our coronal slices. Here's our patamen, here's the caudate, so here's our striatum, these lighter structures here. The thalamic complex is here, just below it, right here. You can see it much better on, on your uh, slides there. This lightest one is the substantia nigra. Just above that, we have our subthalamic nucleus. So those axons from the cortex are going to run down 
and provide intro to the subthalamic nucleus as well as the striatum there. The subthalamic nucleus is very much different from the striatum. Now they're both input nuclei, but STN neurons are glutamatergic, so they're excitatory. They also pace make, meaning they're always firing action potentials. They're going to get input from the cortex. They're also going to have input from other structures within the globe, uh, within the basal ganglia. In this case, the globus pallidus and external segment. <clears throat> that pacemaking allows them to respond to both types of input. Excitatory input from the cortex increases their rate of firing. Inhibitory input from the GPE is going to decrease their rate of firing. They didn't pacemake, gabaergic input wouldn't be as meaningful. So now they can respond in both directions. They can decrease. If they were firing at zero hertz, you can't get any less than that. So their pacemaking allows them to respond to both excitation and inhibition. And their targets are going to be the neighboring substantive nigra and the internal globus pallidus. So our basal ganglia are all right here, just below the thalamus. Here's where we're looking today. There, in other words, the STN is going to affect the output nuclei. That's what these are. Yeah, it's just internal, not external globus. Also, it'll hit external. Yeah, it's a mess. <clears throat> we find body maps in the STN, just like everywhere else. Here we got a couple different ones. One is based on uh, actual motor output. So uh, gets input mostly from the primary motor cortex, the supplementary and pre-motor cortices, which are based on uh, planned actions and externally guided actions. Those create a somewhat separate body map in the subthalamic nucleus. But there's still an orderly arrangement here. You got your head near the forelimb. There's a little bit for the trunk. We don't do a whole lot with this. And then your hind limb there. We move our limbs a whole lot more than we move our trunks, so they occupy a larger um, area of, of the body maps. You got a greater number of neurons dedicated to that. So we're going to start to create some, some pathways here. We got our cortex, that's where we started. We have two inputs into the basal ganglia. The striatum, we're going to see, is going to project a couple different places. The STN does as well. It's going to project to the output nuclei. It's also going to hit this middle man, uh, which then projects everywhere. We'll get to those in the second part of this. But here's our, our basic summary of the basal ganglia. The whole point is to affect thalamic feedback to the cortex. If we inhibit thalamic feedback, we don't do it. If we don't inhibit, we do it. The output nuclei are going to be the internal globus pallidus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata. Globus pallidus means pale globe. It's because it's a, a uh, myelinated nucleus. So there's a lot of myelinated axons that run through it. It makes it look pale. The substantia nigra uh, looks dark because of the dopamine synthesis that takes place there and the neuromelanin that's produced. So your GPI is just right here. Your substantia nigra is here. The, the reticulata sits a little anterior to the uh, compacta, but they're pretty much intermixed. So here's your output nuclei that are going to feed into the thalamus. It's also pacemaker. They're GABAergic. So they're going to provide tonic inhibition to the thalamus. The degree to which they inhibit the thalamus depends on their input. Are they getting glutamatergic input from the STN or are they getting GABAergic input? If they're being inhibited, they don't inhibit the thalamus as much. If they're being excited, they inhibit the thalamus even more. I mean, that's what you have to think. So we're at the output now. These are the neurons that then project to the thalamus. They're going to apply GABAergic input to the motor nuclei of the thalamus. These then feed back to the motor cortex. Now the input to these neurons varies depending on whether it's from the subthalamic nucleus, down here, so the excitatory input, 
from the subthalamic nucleus or the inhibitory input from the striatum. The striatum is massive. There are far more neurons in the striatum than there is in the subthalamic nucleus, and as such, striatal projection neurons can focus on single output neurons in the GPI or SNR. So a lot more focal projections, as we can see here. They'll hit a couple, but they largely focus on one, whereas the subthalamic nucleus, shown in green here, here's our output neurons. You can see far more diffuse projections from the subthalamic nucleus. And that's because it's just a smaller structure. There's fewer neurons to innervate the output nuclei, so they have to spread their axons out. This is actually uh, critical to the function of the basal ganglia because it allows striatal input to be very specific and subthalamic input to be very diffuse. We'll see why that matters when we talk about the pathways and the function of the basal ganglia. Just keep in mind that the input to our output nuclei can be focal, if it's from the STN, I'm sorry, if it's from the striatum, or diffuse, if it's from the subthalamic nucleus or external lobes palates. We also have body maps. There's a bit of a distinction between the substantia nigra and the globus pallidus in terms of what body structures they handle. Your SNR, or your substantia nigra uh, reticulata, is going to largely handle the face and eyes, while the internal globus pallidus is going to more handle the rest. So there'll be some head structures, but largely it's going to be the limbs that the GPI is handling. So both output nuclei are going to have complete body maps, but the face is going to be handled more so by the substantia nigra, while the globus pallidus handles the head and body. But in the end, they both project to the thalamus and inhibit feedback. The last place, um, oh no, we'll have one more. We'll have dopamine after this. The penultimate place is the external globus pallidus. Notice this is a little uh, darker than our striatum here, and that's because of the myelin that's there. This is a myelin stain. So the external segment, the one that's a little more lateral, this is going to be a middleman between pretty much every nucleus within the basal ganglia. These neurons are GABAergic, and they pacemake. They can get excitatory input from the STN. They can get inhibitory input from the striatum. Their targets are going to be the subthalamic nucleus and the output nuclei. Like everywhere else, they also have a body map, not surprisingly. Since they're dealing with motor output, they need to know which parts of the body they're dealing with. And you can see here, they are central in the basal ganglia pathways. Don't worry about all this junk. There's some, there's some extra stuff in here. Here's our globus pallidus external segment. You can see it has GABAergic projections to the output nuclei, as well as both input nuclei, the striatum and the STM. This is going to allow them to widely affect the activity of the globus pallidus, of the basal ganglia. OK, last set of neurons. These are the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra part compacta. So we're again down in the substantia nigra. In this case, we're talking about the neurons a little further back that make dopamine rather than GABA. These are going to project throughout the basal ganglia. For the most part, we're going to be talking about the striatum <coughs> the projections. Okay. This is where we've done uh, most of the work on, GAP, on uh, dopaminergic regulation of basal ganglia function. The dopamine neurons, which project back to the striatum, are going to determine the relative balance of direct and indirect pathway output. They're going to be one of the players here that helps us decide, should I do this or not? You're thinking of getting up and leaving, you don't get a burst of dopamine, it's not a good idea, don't do it. As we age, we're going to lose these neurons uh, for a couple of reasons. One uh, has to do with 
they're large terminal fields. In other words, they project their axon over large volumes. They cover big areas. They're going to innervate multiple neurons. They're not sending focal projections. This one little neuron down here in the substantia nigra is going to project upward. Here's a branch point, and they're just showing you both branches of this axon black hand ring. But this is the same axon. It's covering the striatum from head to toe, front to back. It's hitting pretty much everywhere in that nucleus, at least in this slice. Every dopamine neuron is doing this, because our dopamine neurons are, are found in very distinct areas of the brain. We have them in the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra. That's it. Every bit of dopamine that's spit out in our brain has to come from those neurons, so they have to cover a large area. Because they do that, they have a large surface area. They've got to make a bunch of proteins to fill it up with ion channels, and that ain't free. So they have very high metabolic demands. This makes them prone to metabolic stress. So any dysfunction in mitochondrial uh, function is going to kill your dopamine neurons. And we do see this. These large terminal fields make them prone to oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. So these will die naturally, but it's okay for the most part because they have these large areas. That means they overlap a lot. So you can lose about half your dopamine neurons before you'll start to notice it. The other reason that they die off is because of their pacemaking mechanisms. Like all the other neurons that pace make here, these are firing active potentials all day. But rather than using those HCN channels, that we've talked about before, that are going to use sodium to cause depolarization after the action potential. Dopamine neurons use calcium channels. And calcium is dangerous. If it builds up, you die. You have to keep it at incredibly low levels. So you have to spend a lot of ATP to pump it back into your sacs of calcium, maybe the mitochondria, the, sarco or the endoplasmic reticulum, or out of the cell. So you're spending a lot of ATP keeping that calcium low, and filling up your uh, large amount of membrane with proteins. So dopamine neurons tend to die. If you lose too many of them, then you start to have difficulties uh, initiating action. You have mood disturbances, thought disturbances. There's all the players. We're going to link them together in the next part. What you need to keep in mind is what's their input, what's their output. What neurotransmitter do they release? Or do they pace make? Do we have any questions? Anything that needs to be cleared up? Okay, let's review these then. Okay, it's all in clear, sure. Well, let's clear things up. And I think once we put these together and we walk through the basal ganglia and see the effect on uh, cortical thalamic. Uh, communication. Things will clear up a bit. We're going to talk about three different pathways here. And as you might expect, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is inhibition, disinhibition, dis disinhibition. <laughs> a drawing will be your best friend in terms of, of working this out. So just practice Putting them up, connecting them with either a blunt arrow or a rare occasion a pointy arrow. <laughs> we'll start off with the hyperdirect pathway. Uh, originally, we had the direct and the indirect pathways. Well, and then along came this other pathway that was faster than the direct, so it had to be the hyperdirect. <laughs> well, with the directness. We're talking about time and the number of, of steps involved to some degree, but it's really, really the same number with direct. So hyperdirect, we're talking about five to eight milliseconds. That's the amount of time it takes to go through the basal ganglia and affect thalamic output. That's when we're going to be exciting our output nuclei. This is going to be the fastest one, hence the name. So let, let the names work for you here. Hyperdirect is going to affect output <coughs> first. <coughs>
From here, we're going from the cortex down to the subthalamic nucleus. Here's our glutamatergic neurons. That's going to increase their rate of firing. They're going to excite the output nuclei. That's going to increase their rate of firing. They're going to inhibit the thalamus so that the lambocortical feedback loop gets inhibited. We're not going to excite the cortex. We're not going to execute that command. So with a hyperdirect pathway, we're stimulating the STN. It's going to diffusely excite the GPI and SNR, and that's going to diffusely inhibit the thalamus. This arrives before the direct pathway and provides general inhibition. This is kind of like entering a room and going, Shh, so all the chitter chatter stops. And then one specific message can be sent. That's what the direct pathway is going to do for us. But this is general inhibition because of general excitation of the output nuclei. Because this is inhibiting movement when you have lesions along your hyperdirect pathway. Lesions in the subthalamic nucleus, for example, uh, you get an increase in, in motor output. Should have gone to this sooner. There's your diffuse projections there. When you have lesions, you see involuntary movement. This is a type of chorea called hemibolismus, so it's still an involuntary movement, but rather than being a little more writhing and dance-like, it's more ballistic. So we have a lesion on the left subthalamic nucleus. The filter is now damaged. It's a little leakier. So we're not generally inhibiting the noise anymore. And you'll notice his right leg is just moving around. This is an involuntary movement. This is not what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to sit still. Very difficult to do because of damage in his subthalamic nucleus. So that general inhibition of noise is lost and some of the noise can make its way out. The direct pathway arrives after the hyperdirect pathway. Now after we've silenced the room, now we're going to unsilence specific motor programs. The way that we do that is through excitation of the striatum. Here, we're talking about spiny projection neurons that project directly to the output nuclei. So the direct pathway means we're going directly from the striatum to the output nuclei. GABAergic, so we're inhibiting the output nuclei, and what that does is disinhibit the lambocortical communication. Because remember, the output nuclei are GABAergic. By inhibiting them, that decreases their pacemaking. They don't inhibit the thalamus as much. So those planned actions that get passed in and say, what do you think about it? They get passed back to the cortex. We execute those motor programs and we do something. That's the purpose of the direct pathway. Execute a specific output. Because the projections to the output nuclei are focal. We get general excitation from the subthalamic nucleus, and then we get very specific inhibition from the striatum, so we can do specific things. We also call this the go pathway, because the direct pathway allows us to move, allows us to do things. When you have hyperactivity, you see chorea. So just another example of involuntary movements. Uh, in this case, rather than uh, affecting uh, just a single limb here, we're more affecting the, the head. We get these uh, a little less ballistic movements, a little more writhing. This is another type of motor deficit that you'll see with basal ganglia damage. So these are involuntary actions that aren't getting filtered out. So here we have too much go. We're not selecting the appropriate actions, and we have these dyskinesias here, just involuntary movements. The indirect pathway comes in last, and this is very similar to the hyperdirect pathway in that it's going to provide general inhibition of motor programs. So here's the order of events. Shh, do something, 
That's how the basal ganglia work. General inhibition of the thalamus by the hyperdrive pathway, selective disinhibition of motor nuclei of the thalamus by the direct pathway, and then diffuse inhibition again. So this way we have excellent signal to noise. We cut down the noise. That's what the hyperdrive pathway does. Everybody shut up. Do this one thing. All right, shut up again. I know. And it works. It works pretty well. So the pathway here, cortex to striatum, just like the direct pathway. But now we're not targeting spiny projection neurons that directly project to the output nuclei. We first go through the GPE, the external globus pallidus. So it's indirect. We make a pit stop in the external globus pallidus. Again, GABAergic. So here's what we've done. We've excited the striatum, which has inhibited the external globus pallidus. Normally, the external globus pallidus is inhibiting our output nuclei. There's also an arrow over here. So what we've done is disinhibit then the output nuclei, which dis disinhibits or inhibits uh, the thalamus as a result. So we're going to decrease motor output by stimulating the striatum, inhibiting the GPE, disinhibiting the output nuclei, and inhibiting the thalamus. That's that final We also disinhibit the STN, which again excites the output nuclei just like it does in the hyperdrive pathway, and that also contributes to the So this allows us to have very uh, uh, quick execution of action by the direct pathway, and that's flanked on both sides by inhibition of the thalamus. That decreases noise because there's always junk going on in your brain. So that junk gets filtered out by inhibition from the output nuclei. So we just temporarily relieve that inhibition with the direct pathway. We also call the indirect pathway the no-go pathway. <coughs> that helps you get go, no-go. The indirect pathway is there to stop motor output. Whenever you have hyperactivity in the indirect pathway, you see the opposite of what occurs with direct pathway hyperactivity. You don't see chorea. Instead, you see poverty of movement here, inability to initiate movements, slowed movements, reduced amplitude of movements. So akinesia, bradykinesia, hyperkinesia. So here's a gentleman with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. He's having difficulty standing up. He can't initiate his actions here because he has hyperactivity in the indirect pathway. So there's a lot of no-go going on. His striatum is biased toward this pathway, this output. So we're inhibiting our GPE, we're disinhibiting the output <coughs> nuclei, and we're inhibiting the thalamus. So those planned actions that are passed down from the cortex get inhibited, and we don't execute those motor programs. That's not connected to that resting tremor then? The resting tremor has to do with the reciprocal connections between the GPE and STN. There's probably also some peripheral abnormalities, but what, what this creates, because you have pacemaking neurons that are reciprocally connected. When one is active, it excites the other, but that one inhibits this one. So you get these oscillations of activity at about the same frequency that you see the tremor. So what you're really getting is not just straight up no go, you're getting go, no go, go, no go, go, no go and that creates the tremor, along with peripheral changes as well. So this is related to it. We won't discuss that in any more detail than what I just said, um, but that's what creates the tremor. What creates the poverty of movement is just the increased output. So over, a, if you sample a large period of time, there is an increase in, in GABAergic input to the thalamus, but it's not just tonic increase, it's phasic increase. Still, overall increased inhibition, but there's these little valleys that'll create the tremor. What determines whether we have direct or indirect activity uh, depends on what else is going on in the striatum. And there's two things that we have to consider. First is that dopamine input. 
So the SNC is going to provide dopamine to the dorsal striatum and bias it toward direct pathway activity if we should do something. Dopamine is an important uh, determinant of should I do this. Of course, there's calculations upstream of those dopamine neurons that determine is this a good thing to do. Has this worked out for me in the past, for example? If crying gets you your toys, well, damn it, I'm going to cry. I want my toy. That's worked out before. So when you're thinking, should I cry? Dopamine comes in. Absolutely. Go. Cry. If it doesn't work out, you might not do it. And that's because the spiny projection neurons are projecting the direct pathway and the indirect pathway have different types of dopamine neurons. I'm sorry, dopamine receptors. So the dopamine input from the SNC, when we get a little blast all throughout the striatum, both types are activated, both D1 and D2. Here we can see the difference between these neurons here. So a direct spiny projection neuron is shown on top. Here is just a little single cell PCR showing you that it does indeed express D1, but not D2, 3 or 4. These are your D2 type. Why is D1? On the other hand, an indirect pathway spinal projection neuron shown down here expresses D2 type dopamine receptors. D2, 3, and 4 are both the GI couple D2 class dopamine receptors. So, excitatory for direct pathway inhibitory for indirect pathway. And that's because of what happens under the hood. We've seen this before, but just as a reminder, those GS coupled D1 dopamine receptors are going to increase the level of cyclic AMP because they're going to stimulate adenylyl cyclase just like they've done in every other lecture. We brought them up in. That increase in cyclic AMP is going to increase the conductance at cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels when you increase cation conductance, <coughs> you depolarize the neuron and you make it more excitable. So that blast of dopamine stimulates direct spiny projection neurons. The indirect pathway spiny projection neurons, on the other hand, with their D2 class dopamine receptors, these are going to have a decrease in cyclic AMP levels when dopamine arrives because they're GI coupled. This inhibits adenylyl cyclase. We have a decrease in cyclic AMP levels, a decrease in cation conductance, and thus a decrease in excitability. So that dopamine input that says, I want a toy, let's cry, is going to stimulate your go pathway, inhibit your no-go pathway, and so you cry. Of course, when you're thinking of getting up and leaving class, you don't have a burst of dopamine input. So we're going to be biased more toward indirect pathway activity. This is because we have a second type of input to consider. It's not just about dopamine. We also have our large A spiny neurons. They're back. These pace make. They're still cholinergic neurons in the striatum. And they're going to affect the output of spiny projection neurons. And they're going to do it differently, whether it's direct or indirect pathway neurons. Direct. This is the opposite of what we see with dopamine. Now we're not exciting, we are inhibiting. So here's the pacemaking activity of a large A spiny neuron, meaning they're always putting out a little bit of acetylcholine. This helps keep the filter tight, so we don't have involuntary motor program output. So we bias ourselves toward indirect pathway activity, in other words, because of the tonic output of our large A spiny neurons. What that acetylcholine does is act on muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. The direct spiny projection neurons have GI coupled M4 muscarinic receptors. GI, we're going to inhibit adenylyl cyclase, decrease cyclic AMP, and decrease cation conductance. We'll be a little less excitable. The indirect pathway is activated by M1 muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. These are GQ coupled. This will elevate intracellular calcium levels. This will be exciting. If we want to execute a movement, rather than turning on like we do for dopamine neurons, here we turn off our large A spiny neurons. So we see a decrease in cholinergic output whenever we have an initiation of action. 
And this tends to occur with uncued actions. So what they're doing is recording from large a spiny neurons. Each row is just showing you a different recording. So you look at them as a whole. Here they're showing you the trigger signal, so they flash a light and that tells the, the monkey to reach forward. In some cases they cued them, they gave them a little auditory signal beforehand, and when that occurred they didn't see the, the drop there. So it's, it's a little more complicated than just turn them off every time. But, at least in the uncued conditions, what they see whenever they shine the light on to tell the monkey, go get that thing. It has to do it quickly because it didn't have the cue before. It wasn't expecting this. So the rapid execution occurs because of a decrease in large ace binding neuron output. You'll notice there's a period right here where we tend not to see activity as opposed to the neighboring regions. So you'll notice this little dip in output just after that instructive signal there. This decreases inhibition of the direct pathway and allows for more rapid execution of action. So we got two things that determine, are we biased more toward action or inaction? And that's gonna be dopamine input or cholinergic input. And they do opposite things. So taken together, what we think our basal ganglia are gonna do is allow us to select appropriate actions. <coughs> and part of that is just getting rid of, getting rid of the noise. That's your hyperdirect pathway, cortex, SDN. Stimulate your GPI and SNR diffusely and diffusely inhibit the thalamus. So the first thing that happens, we got this global inhibition. So here we're, we're thinking about flammocortical signaling as a plane and, a, and a, a mountain is going to be an increase in signaling and a, a valley is a decrease in this case. And you'll notice there's kind of a global decrease there because of that global inhibition from the hyperdread pathway. Focal excitation. Notice a very distinct peak surrounded by inhibition. All that inappropriate crap. Don't do that. Do that one thing I want you to do. And then the indirect pathway comes in afterward to silence that. So we make our decision to carry out the action and then we move on to something else. General inhibition, focal excitation, general inhibition. We think the basal ganglia might also be important for swiftly executing actions. Rapid decision making is what occurs here. The reason that we think this is because infusion of a GABA agonist into the striatum is of course going to inhibit it. So we inhibit, when we inhibit striatal output, when we inhibit basal ganglia signaling, what we see is bradykinesia. Slowed movement, in other words. So when you inhibit communication within the basal ganglia, when you prevent the striatum from doing its job, what you see is slow movement. That tells us that part of its job is rapid execution of actions. And rapid execution of appropriate actions, the reason why we think appropriate actions here is because when you increase striatal output rather than decreasing, you don't see a slow uh, movement, you see dyskinesia in that case. So what they did here was inhibit those inhibitory interneurons. And that, what that does is increase striatal output. So remember we have those A-spiny interneurons that inhibit spiny projection neurons? Well, they just inhibited those in this case. Here's, here's the evidence for that. So they infuse a drug that's going to act on a very specific type of amper receptor that only your, what they're calling fast spiking interneurons those base binding interneurons, in other words. When you infuse the drug, in red here, we're looking at the firing rate of the ACE binding interneurons, and you'll notice it drops down around zero. What happens to the spiny projection neuron output as a result is no longer inhibited, so it increases. So we increase striatal output. What happens in that case 
is a whole lot of contralateral dyskinesia. This mouse here has these jerky movements, these involuntary jerky movements. Because the basal ganglia wasn't able to appropriately inhibit motor programs. So part of what it's doing is allowing us to quickly execute actions, but the other part of that is allowing us to quickly execute the appropriate action by filtering out the garbage. You'll sometimes see motor deficits with antipsychotic use. This likely has to do with the effect on basal ganglia function. Remember, dopamine is one of those switches that determines are we biased toward direct or indirect pathway output. And your antipsychotics, while they'll hit a variety of dopamine receptors, for the most part, we're talking D2. So we're talking D2 antagonists. You'll see a couple different things depending on whether we're talking about acute doses or long-term use. So what's the effect of the drug and what's the effect of homeostasis is really what we're talking about here. Dystonia will occur uh, or can occur acutely with antipsychotic use as we're seeing here. Hold on, I don't know how loud this is going to be. Involuntarily, kind of cocked back, mouth open. No, you don't do cocaine. He's unable to put his face in a typical position. Okay. So he's taking um, an antipsychotic here. And on occasion, you'll see this reaction. They're going to treat him with Benadryl. He'll be fine later on. But he's having difficulty with initiating appropriate movements. He can't talk properly. And that's because he has this increase in basal ganglia output. D2 antagonist, we're going to antagonize the indirect pathway. So we can't finish our motor programs, essentially. So we get this increased uh, go, in other words, a prolonged go signal, and that gives us our dystonia. With prolonged use of antipsychotics, you'll see tardive dyskinesia. So whenever we keep inhibiting our D2 antagonists, of course, the D2 receptors are going to upregulate. We'll have decreased basal ganglia output. We're going to see involuntary action rather than being locked in a certain position. Here we'll just see inappropriate movements passing on through because our filter isn't working properly. Usually, this occurs in the mouth. You'll see lip smacking. This is this is common after prolonged antipsychotic use. So you'll see inappropriate actions going through. So you'll notice the involuntary mouth movements as she's talking. These antipsychotics are going to affect basal ganglia output and as a result affect our ability to select appropriate actions. In some cases it becomes difficult to actually select the action and in other cases it's difficult to filter out the junk. Anytime you're messing with dopamine signaling, for a prolonged period of time, you run the risk of having homeostasis come in 
and create a long-lived change in function. All right, do we have any questions on our pathways? We've got three of them. They have different timing and basically two different effects on motor output, inhibition or selective excitation. Anything you want to clear up before we move ahead? Okay, then let's review these. 